A while ago, I made a video about a foaming soap dispenser. This is a battery operated device that you put a, your, your favourite hand soap in or shampoo and you dilute it with one part of shampoo to about, say, five parts water. And when you put your hand underneath, it's got a pulsed infrared source. It detects your hand and it squirts some foam into it. And I thought it was pretty interesting. So I bought a few others to take a look at. This is one that I've been testing for a while, and it's been okay. It's got a nice feature in that it lets you choose a large quantity of soap or a small quantity of soap, but recently it slowed down dramatically. So if I turn this on by pressing and holding this button, it uh, flashes a blue LED, and then when you put your hand underneath, it runs the motor inside, but it's really sluggish compared to what it used to be, and it was pumping out much uh, the foam much slower. So I thought, okay, let's open it up. So this was quite interesting in that it's got uh, two levels of soap. If you press it and it goes green, it will actually run for much longer. So you get a much bigger portion of soap. And if you press and hold it, it go, goes red and then it goes off. This thing also, it takes uh, three AA size batteries. I've been using rechargeables. And one rechargeable will pretty much last for one sort of container of soap before it needs recharged. Uh, but it also has the connect the possibility of putting a connector in here for potentially USB, I'm guessing, a USB power supply. But let's explore it. Let's get the circuit board off and reverse engineer it. Now, before I do this, I'm noticing it's got a few connectors and they're all identical. So I'm going to get a blue sharp. I'm going to put a blue mark in this one and a blue mark there. And this is the marks that I'll probably wash off later somehow with solvent accidentally but i'll also put a red dot in that connector in there and on its housing and we're ready to take it apart i'll take the pump apart too we'll take a look at the circuit board and then we'll take a look at the pump i'm just looking for a suitable screwdriver here i shall grab this one since it's handy the circuit board in this one is smaller it looks much simpler Is it going to come out? Oh, there's another screw. My guess of why it's blocked, it's slowed down. Oh, that's rubber. That's interesting. Uh, my guess of why it's slowed down, that is a very simple circuit board compared to the other, is that either the pump has just got water in it and it's corroded a bit, or it's possible that the output of the pump, the foam, the bit, the mesh that produces the foam has actually blocked up. But we can find that out by seeing... Uh, what happens when we pull the hose off this. In fact, let's just take that out right now. Let's take everything out. Oh, you know what I've just spotted? I've spotted that will clamp for an 18650 cell. That's interesting. Is it designed for rechargeable batteries as well? Let's pull this off. And I shall blow through this hose and see if I can blow through it one moment. It doesn't feel too restricted. I think we may have to strip the pump. So tell you what, before I do this, I'm going to reverse engineer the circuit board and we'll take a look at the circuitry and then we'll go into the pump itself. One moment, please. The reverse engineering is done. Let's explore. It's based on a very common little 7-pin microcontroller, 14-pin microcontroller. Uh, microcontroller. Uh, so things worthy of note. This is a lithium battery charging chip. It's got an extra connector. It's obviously designed to have either the three AA's or a USB charger uh, charging a lithium battery. What they've done here, they've connected AA batteries into the lithium uh, battery point just to power the circuitry directly. And they've just left this connector empty. It's nice that they've included that, though it does mean that theoretically, by a bit of rewiring inside, you could actually add a USB charge lead and a lithium battery. The things worthy of note, we have a transistor down here switching the motor. It's got a back EMF spike suppression diode and a little uh, filter capacitor across it. We have the infrared LED, which is pulsed at quite high current through this resistor and this MOSFET. And then we have what looks like a photodiode, just forming a bridge and going back to the mi microcontroller. And then for the indication, we have this three-color LED um, and a button for the input. It's all very straightforward. I shall bring in the circuit diagram. Here's the potential USB supply coming in. Uh, it then feeds the charger. 
It also has a resistive divider that will send a signal to the microcontroller to tell it's plugged into the charger so it can do the flashing LEDs, you know, I'm charging sort of thing like that. And it can also then monitor the state of the charge via this 1K resistor feeding the uh, input pin of the microcontroller so the LTH7 can signal to it when the battery is fully charged. The charging current is set by this 4K7 resistor uh, pulled to the zero volt rail. To keep this as uncluttered as possible, I've used these little uh, blocks to refer to indicate the negative rail, the zero volt. It just means that the drawing has much less lines on it. Their battery here is connected across the output of the LTH7 and the zero volt rail, and uh, it can be the three double A's or the lithium. That then powers the microcontroller. Local decoupling capacitor on the microcontroller, the push button just pulls one of the input pins to ground. The output, when it's inactive, it pulses about four or five hertz. It just stabs this infrared LED and it's pulsing it at fairly high current. This is a 5.1 ohm resistor. Typical voltage drop across that infrared LED is about 1.2 volts kink calculator. Let's say average voltage of the lithium cell, let's say it's about 3.2 six at a mid charge um, that would also work well with the three double a rechargeables uh, minus the 1.2 of that uh, led 2.4 divided by 5.1 ohm potentially gives almost half an amp but it's only sharp pulses uh, to that led that couples across to a photodiode now this diode uh, is actually mounted in reverse. A typical photodiode, I'm assuming it's a photodiode, I'm not really sure. It's this little black LED type, type thing here. So there's the infrared one that's visible in the camera when it's active as a series of spikes. But because they're so short, the camera doesn't catch every single one of them. So it sort of goes in waves. Uh, this is the receiver diode and it forms a potential divider with this 180k resistor and goes to the input. So it will probably be an analog to digital converter. And in normal use, it will, when it's powered up, it will look at the average value. And if it sees a sudden change in the voltage here, it will assume that somebody's put their hand in front because what would happen here is that uh, the brighter the reflected beam, the higher it will pull up to the positive rail. So if it sees a sudden peak, it will uh, register that as hand activity. It's possible that there's no fancy analog. It, maybe it's just a... a fixed threshold, but I would expect it to compensate, so I would expect an analog to digital converter. But you never know, there might not be. The two MOSFETs, one for driving the infrared LED and the one for the motor, have a very classic circuit. They've got a 10k pull-down resistor to make sure they turn off uh, when the processor is powered up or unstable. Um, and then they, they're pulled, the gate is pulled high by that 1k resistor to turn each one on. The motor has the back EMF spike suppression diode there that just basically provides a freewheeling round to actually shunt that out and stop it damaging the transistor with a high voltage spike. And it's got that suppression capacitor. There's an odd thing. This LED here on the circuit board has the three chips in it. It's a classic 50-50. And it's the type with six pins. You've got the green, red and blue, but then you've got positives for each of those at the other side. Instead of just taking it to the positive rail, and I don't know why they did this, they've taken it to the microcontroller and so it can switch the LED positive and then it's got the three resistors going down to actually limit the current through each of the LEDs. In this case, the red LED has a higher value resistor so they get roughly the same current. I think that's about 680 ohms versus the 470 ohms the other, but that LED only lights very briefly. They could, if they wanted this is a positive rail here they could take the positive rail down here and to that i don't know why they didn't do that but instead they took it back via pin it's possible they just did that because at the time when they were designing it it was easier to take it back to a pin and just assign it as an output uh, just to provide an alternative uh, track layout um, anything else on here that's worth mentioning not really no so i'm wondering then if this little circuit board on the side of the connector, uh, which would theoretically let you plug a connector in instantly, the black and the red are wrong. The red is connected to negative here and the black is connected to positive, and it goes up, and strangely enough, the connector is marked incorrectly 
on the circuit board as well. That's quite strange. But I get the feeling that the extra connector, normally the lithium battery would have been plugged into one of those connectors and then if you remove these two wires, this would come from this USB charge port where it is just a little jack connector in here that once the battery's out, you can actually access it. And uh, they would have plugged a USB charging lead in there. Okay, I think it's time to clear the area of get a bit of paper towel because we're going to open this pump and we'll explore um, what made this slow down. One moment, please. Let's explore the moose generator and I've found something very nice about this. The moose generator is basically a pump that draws liquid in and it sucks air in from the side and it combines it with the liquid and blows it out as a sort of bubbly air mix. But it then goes through this little unit, it gets converted into a, a thick mousse. And rather pleasingly, I didn't realise this before, I tried cleaning this out. I found that the output nozzle is just the right size for a syringe so you could pump liquid back through it. But then I thought this was glued. It is not glued. It's an O-ring. It's kind of a friction fit. And inside are, well, let's say, Let's knock one out, shall we? I shall make a huge mess here, shall I, with water. Uh, it's not going to come out. Oh, it's out. Inside is a little plastic cup with holes like a little pepper pot. And beyond that, I'm going to have to dry this out so you can see it because it's quite hard to remove because it is a friction fit. Beyond that is a gauze. Let's see if I can zoom down this. But there's a metallic gauze inside that with lots, of, effectively lots, that's being used as fine mesh of holes. And when the liquid is squirted in, let me bring in a wee notepad thing and show you this. I doodled it down. When the liquid comes in, it's a coarse air and soap mix. It enters and goes through those coarse holes in the plastic uh, cup with the sort of pepper pot holes and that causes a sort of fairly coarse bubble layer. And then as the air keeps pushing it through, the coarse bubbles are pushed through that mesh and it breaks it into tiny bubbles and that's what creates the thick mousse coming out. Let's see if we can make some thick mousse right now. I've got the bench power supply here. I shall put this little plastic cup back in here, shove that back in, stuff it back onto the top of this. This is where when I put it back in the machine, it's just gonna like splurge stuff everywhere. And I did clean the mesh. I didn't. It didn't look particularly dirty, but that doesn't mean it's not dirty. It may have got some typical goo that you get from these things just through general sort of, well, water. So I shall pop the negative connection on here, make sure the bench supply is off here, positive connection on here, get a little bowl in, and we'll try squirting and see what happens. It is squirting out. It's up to its normal speed. It's happily squirting out a, a thick, creamy mousse. I've shown these in the past and people said, could you put cream through it? I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend putting food through something like this for hygiene purposes because it might be quite hard to clean. Tell you what, let's open this up. Uh, I'm going to get this mousse out of the way. One moment, please. Okay, let's explore the pump. I'll take the foam outlet off and the liquid inlet off. And before I go any further, I'm going to get a bit of paper towel and I'm going to get some isopropyl alcohol and I'm going to wipe the side and then I'm going to mark it. So I'm going to wipe the, I'm going to mark it down here next to this little pipe, just because I think that's probably the best place to mark it. So I'll degrease the surface first. Dry it. And then get a Sharpie and put a line down here just to help put it back together again once we have thoroughly destroyed it. There we go. Because these things are all supposed to line up. I bet I rub the mark off it while taking it to bits. That sometimes happens, particularly if there's grease in it. Grease or grease, depending where you come from. So this unit pulls in air. Previous ones I looked at actually pulled in from the side. Not seeing anything obvious here. I shall zoom down a bit for this. Let us explore it in greater detail. 
So I shall take these screws out. I seem to remember that there was an ear in that that went right in the side of one of these screws. I'm not sure why they did that. Maybe it was just the easiest way to do it during manufacturing. I don't see the air in that. That, that wouldn't be the liquid side anyway. Screw number two, a slightly grubby screw, I have to say. Ooh, it is looking about corroded. And screw number three. Makes me wonder if some liquid has been squirting out of that. Actually, you know what? The corroded one actually has the little air hole. Can you see the air hole at the side of it? That's a, an odd thing to do, but I suppose it's really doesn't. It's not pulling a huge amount of air. Every one of these screws looks slightly different, doesn't it? Ugh. So here's the, the diaphragm section. It's all full of liquid. This is not a surprise. So the motor here has the little offset, off-center hub in it that goes round. And it uh, basically makes the, uh, makes this little rubber plate wobble like this. So it's like almost like little uh, three little plungers moving in and out. Um, I can see two big ones and I can see a small one. The small one is the liquid one because uh, it takes more pressure to move a small amount of liquid. The air is a lot more compressible. So the big ones will be for the air and the little one will be for the liquid. Now, oh, there's the flaps. There's the uh, one-way valves. Does this come apart easy enough? Yes. Uh, so the air will be pulled in from the top. And two of these sections here will be for, they'll be connected. These two are connected. So these are the two air ones, and that's the liquid one. So as the plungers go back, they actually pull these little umbrella flaps are basically just pushed in. It's a little flap of silicon. They'll pull the liquid or the air through those and those will sort of bend down to let the liquid through as the plunger pulls back. And then when the plunger goes forward again, they'll go through these three common holes. And that will be to one common soft silicon umbrella plunger that lets the liquid go back out and out to the film nozzle. but the, So this will actually, the middle one will be porting out the combination of liquid and um, air. So the, oh, there is, there's the little air hole that's going out to the outer screw hole. Uh, and there's the liquid channel. So this port here is for liquid and these two that are coupled together are for air. Right, now I assemble it again and uh, see if I can make it work. So this middle pin goes into this offset recess with a bit of grease in it. And I shall rotate it until, I don't know if it really matters this one, but I'm going to rotate it so the line matches it anyway. Then I've got my valve plate which will go on like this what happens if you put it the wrong way around it doesn't go on if you put it the wrong way around these are sized differently oh that one's visibly bigger okay so it will only go on the right way around oh which way does this go around does it really matter probably not probably does i think i shall put it with that pattern up the way. Can't really remember. I didn't take note of which way that was up before. I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe that'd be better placed another part first. Mumble, 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 as I try and remember how the thing went back together. I'll find out when I put it back together if it just leaks horribly. And where is my mark? My mark is over there. Oh, that is not going together too easily, is that? Oh, that is. That's looking pretty good, I have to say. Right, tell you what, let's get the screws back in before it falls apart again. There's the one that had the sort of like the hole 
you think this is going to work when I've put it back together? So the operation, this screw is that little hole that pulls the air in, the liquid's pulled in through here by those plungers and then they're both combined and it puts out the mixture of serve and air out that uh, hole there. So I shall tighten these down. And then I shall put it back in the power supply and we'll see if this squirts liquid everywhere out the side or if it actually does anything sensible. Actually, you know, we'll do it without the foamer just to see what comes out the end of the thing. I shall uh, wiggle these in to get them into place. It should drop like the other ones once it goes so far. I was hoping that would go in easier, but it's not. And then once I've got these in, I'll do what you normally do is stuff like this. And you go round and uh, tighten it individually in a rhythmic pattern to make sure it all tightens down evenly onto that. And I'll also make sure the little uh, rubber seal is also in position there. So that one's good. That one's good. And that one feels good. It's nice that it's completely serviceable. That is really nice. Liquid line on. Uh, plug that back onto here. What's going to happen? Let's try it without the foamer and then we'll try it with the foamer. So I'll get the bench power supply here, put the negative on here. Zoom out a bit. I hope I was in a shot there. I think I was in a shot there. I get distracted and then I don't look at the camera. So this should be blowing out coarse bubbles. So that's it coarse before it's actually been triple moosed. Uh, then you put this on. if I can get this on, and this will triple miss it and turn it into that thick hand fondant or whatever you might want to call it. Creamy mousse robot jizz, whatever you want. It's that. So there we go. I'm going to assemble this back into the unit uh, and then I'm going to see if it works. One moment, please. Okay, it's back together. I've got the batteries back and I'm just holding this uh, liquid container in. Incidentally, this is a weakness of this design. It has a dip tube in here and it's designed that you can basically lift this off and fill it up, then bring it back and it's got a little plug. But when you squeeze it, it tends to squeeze liquid out of that. Uh, and because it's quite hard to clip back in, uh, it makes a huge mess when you do so. So it's now back together. This button, if you just press it and let go, the red LED lights, but it doesn't do anything other than that. It actually needs a long press. And then the blue has lit to show it's active. I put my finger on there, that's why it went off straight away. Uh, but now it puts out a little controlled portion every time you put your hand underneath. But if you press that button again, I'll try and do it with it, and it goes green, it puts out a much bigger portion of the foam. Uh, so that is it working again. So I'm going to assemble it back together. That was quite interesting to explore. It's a very simple circuit board in that. Much simpler than the other one that I took apart. I prefer this one. It seems more versatile and it still seems to have no problem uh, detecting the vicinity of a hand for dispensing the foam. But there we go. The automatic foam dispenser. This one was faulty. I think basically the little mooser bit was clogged up. And now I've done that, it's fixed. Good result.